Good evening, everyone. We're going to uh, get underway. Uh, welcome. As uh, most of you know, I'm Craig Snyder, the president of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Uh, and as always, we begin with the obligatory announcement of the 21st century. Please take a moment, if you haven't done so, to turn off your electronic devices. Um, I want to ask you to start marking your calendars. This is the, uh, the last uh, program uh, of uh, 2015 for us, and a, a great way to, uh, to end. Um, but I'd like to uh, ask you to uh, start thinking about our programs uh, that we have planned next year. On January 25th, uh, the Council will host another author, uh, Robert Boynton, who's going to talk about the North Korean abductions of Japanese citizens that occurred in the 1970s and 80s. So, uh, not very well known, but important and fascinating story. Uh, then in February, we have a, uh, what I would perhaps uh, a little bit darkly call a Valentine's Day themed program uh, about uh, the uh, and it features Rod Norland, um, uh, who many of you may remember as a Philadelphia Inquirer uh, writer, uh, who, and we're joined by Philadelphia Media Network in presenting this program. And he's going to share the story of the Romeo and Juliet of Afghanistan. Uh, later uh, in, the, uh, in the spring, uh, we are working, beginning on April 12th, on a series, a three-part series covering uh, topics uh, related to Islam uh, in the world and the West in the Islamic world. Uh, the first part of this feature will feature uh, former Ambassador Mark Grossman, who has uh, spoken for the Council before and is really, uh, I think, one of the most engaging and uh, enlightening speakers uh, that we've had. Uh, these events uh, and the Council's citizen diplomacy trips, which some of you have participated in, along with the support of our corporate members, directly enable us to do our most important programs, as all of you know, uh, providing a, a diverse group of over 2,200 middle and high school students in 90 schools throughout the Philadelphia area with skills and sensibilities that they need in order to thrive and compete uh, in the global community. Uh, now to tonight's uh, main event. I'd like to uh, bring up uh, Bob King. Bob serves as a member of the council's board and as the regional president for First Niagara Bank, a generous corporate sponsor for this evening. Uh, so many thanks to First Niagara for its support, uh, and please join me in welcoming Bob. Uh, thank you, Craig, for the uh, introduction. It's my uh, pleasure to be here tonight. If you are, are all at all familiar with the presidential speeches, you have probably heard some of Ms. Noonan's work. She is known for writing President Ronald Reagan's speech honoring the 40th anniversary of D-Day and for his address to the nation after the Challenger explosion. Both of these speeches have been praised with the Challenger speech in particular, ranking as one of the best American speeches of this century. After leaving the speech writing, Ms. Noonan has continued her participation in the political sphere. In her Wall Street Journal column, she has written about Republican, presidential, and vice presidential candidates in 2008 and 2012. She has also written numerous books that revolve around politics and political figures, including her most recent work, uh, The Time of Our Lives. Through all these ventures, Ms. Noonan has had a far-reaching and remarkable career, uh, and she's here tonight to discuss how she became one of the most influential voices in America. Please join me in welcoming Peggy Newton. Hello. Thank you for coming this evening, a, a busy Tuesday evening during the holidays. Thank you very much. Um, I am Peggy Noonan. <laughs> I'm very happy you are here. I'm very happy to be in Philadelphia. I'm happy to appear before the Philadelphia World Affairs Council. I believe you are well named. Here's why. A great thing happened once in Philadelphia. I think you know what it was. Many great things have happened in Philadelphia, and I think you know what they are. But the thing that happened, I 
how many years ago, my gosh, 240 years ago, uh, the invention of America certainly did affect world affairs. Therefore, your title is most apt. I also want to warn you of something. Have any of you seen Hamilton? Okay, let me tell you what we're doing in Hamilton. I've seen Hamilton twice, the Broadway musical. I'll be going soon for a third time. In the subtlest possible way, we are suggesting to the world in Hamilton that we in New York invented America. <laughs> Philadelphia, fight for your place. Go to see that musical, enjoy that musical, and tell all of your, your children, yes, he invented the banking system. We invented America. So I always think if you come to Philadelphia, Philadelphia and mention 1776, you'll get on everybody's nerves. But in a whole new way, I think, no, 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 concentrate, hold on to it. Um, I thank Bob for his introduction. Uh, I found it almost embarrassingly flattering. But that's because I wrote it. <laughs> It is not really. Seriously, seriously, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Bob's introduction was very gracious and very nice, and it reminded me of something that I once saw of Walter Mondale do. He ran against my old boss, Mr. Reagan, in 1984. And because I was working for Reagan at that time, and Walter Mondale was in Washington making a big union speech at the very big Hilton Hotel ballroom, I left the White House and went over to watch him do his thing. So it was a raucous, big, fabulous union, public employee union rally. And the man who introduced Walter Mondale just said the most sweet, wonderful, soul-stirring, positive things about him. And it actually crossed my mind, how is Walter Mondale going to be equal to that introduction? How is he going to respond to it? And he did something I found so charming. He said to the man, you know, the guy introduces him, Walter walks out, looks at the guy, looks at him, looks at the audience, and then he said, I don't deserve those kind words, but then I have arthritis, and I don't deserve that either, so what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> and I gotta tell you, that is my favorite response um, to, a, to a beautiful introduction uh, ever. Uh, I did, as Bob noted, uh, work for President Reagan and the first President Bush when he was running for the presidency. I did not work for him in the White House after he was uh, elected. These two facts, the fact of working with Mr. Reagan and the first Mr. Bush, uh, have been an unambiguous blessing in my life. I was lucky to be traveling in history and through time. Uh, with those two wonderful men, I tell a story, for it is true, of something that uh, happened to me a few years ago, actually going back now about 15 years ago, when I was thinking these happy thoughts about how lucky I was to work for these two guys. Um, I was on my way to speak to a substantial group, an interesting and important group in Houston, Texas. I was in a great mood. I was up in a plane, there were sunny skies, I got bumped up to first class, uh, I was very happy, I think a Bloody Mary was sort of involved. So I'm going into Houston and you know sometimes you can approach Houston from a certain angle where it seems like almost out of this meaningless desert suddenly these big skyscrapers are, are jumping up out of, out of what seems almost desert. And, it was dusk and the skyscrapers were turning sort of golden and sort of red. It's beautiful, I'm happy, I'm drinking the Bloody Mary. <laughs> I had thought throughout the flight that the stewardess was looking at me now and then. I'd look at her and she'd sort of look away. We landed and it turned out I was correct. Um, she walked up to me after we got into the sort of jetway thing. She walked up to me. She bent down and she said very sweetly, she said, excuse me, but aren't you that woman who worked for Reagan and went on to write books and articles and talk about them on TV? So that's a nice way to begin a trip, right? So I said, 
well, yes, I guess I am. <laughs> and she was so awed, and she said, well, it is just an honor to meet you, Mrs. Kirkpatrick. <laughs> So you know, nothing is an unmixed blessing. I actually got to tell Jean Kirkpatrick that story. She laughed. Um, as for Mr. Bush, old 41, George H.W. Bush, I still write to him. He has about, he keeps up to this day an active correspondence with about 2,000 of his closest friends. I suspect there are some people in this room who have received uh, notes from him uh, uh, fairly recently, uh, I sent him a copy, normally I send him copies of my books, on my last book, which was six or seven years ago, it was patriotic, called Patriotic Grace, I sent it to him, I was all excited about it, and I wanted him to see it. Um, he got it, and as is his want, he wrote back to me right away, he promised to read it, he wished me onward, have a good book tour. And then it, that was typed. He was still using a typewriter, I guess, in those days, or at least a computer that looked like it had a typewriter typing on it. But at the bottom, he would always write a nice little note. And at, indeed, at the bottom of that note, he wrote the words, really, Peggy, good luck. I just hope your book is the great success Millie's was. <laughs> <laughs> Millie, some of you clearly remember, was a dog. <laughs> Millie was the Bush's dog. Millie wrote a book during the first, the Bush administration called Millie's Book. Uh, it came out at the same time as my first book and so sweetly it sold three times as many copies as my first book. Uh, I did not hold it against Millie. I was gracious about it. I would, in the years when George H.W. Bush became president and went to live in the White House, I, who had been living in Washington, returned to my native New York and, and finished my first book there. But around Christmas time, the Bushes were very kind. They would always include me into a former staff member's Christmas party. And I would fly down from New York each year for that party. And I'd always, you know, see Millie kind of curled up in the corner, surrounded by her little puppies. And I'd always go over and say hello to the little bitch. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, Father. Uh, I don't want to take time away uh, from our from our Q and A this evening. Uh, you're a group of true stature, of known stature on the speaking circuit. You are well known. So I was very flattered to be invited here. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm excited about my collection. All books are a labor of love, or should be. But this one, even within that context, is rather uh, special for me. It involved, once I agreed to do this, it involved going through many big white cardboard boxes, um, you know, torn out of the backs of closets and up in the attic and a warehouse in Queens, going through these boxes which contained 30 years of work, essays, op-ed pieces, columns, commentaries that I'd done along the way, and finding, literally opening up each box, going through it, reading everything I had written that had appeared in public. Uh, finding what I loved, finding what I didn't, separating it all into piles, definite yes, I'm not sure, definitely not. This one kept growing, but interestingly, this one did too. Um, Rereading everything again, distilling it down, deciding what was in the I want this in the book part, and then distilling it further. The whole process um, allowed me to find themes in my work and to make certain discoveries. Uh, I discovered that all these years I have had one subject and it is America, its politics, its history, its culture, 
What it does each day and fails to do, its greatness game, its fun. It is a great privilege to have or take such a subject. I have been lucky, we have been lucky, but I've been especially lucky as a writer on what's going on to live in such exciting times, and I've been lucky to be a columnist who columnizes about them. That's all I have to say. Now I'm going to sit down, watch. I'm going to do this very graciously. I'm going to go sit down, and I'm going to have a lovely conversation with Craig. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So uh, I've had the, uh, the privilege, uh, and it, it really is a pleasure, to read uh, the book. Not everyone in the room has done so yet. Bad sure they, people. Sure they will. Bad, bad people. Uh, the, uh, the, the life and times about which you write are, I think, much too, much too rich uh, a vein uh, to be mined in, in a brief conversation. So I'm going to sort of jump around. Uh, jump and ask a number of questions about uh, perhaps smaller things uh, that I found particularly uh, interesting and notable uh, in the book in no particular order except for the first question, which is notable for our place here in Philadelphia, as you mentioned. Uh, you did a piece about Thomas Jefferson in enduring uh, editing by committee mm -hmm. of the Declaration of Independence. Yes. Uh, and you noted one change which was made that particularly pained him. Yes. Can you tell our audience what that is? We could have been such friends together. Jefferson was a great writer. When it came to the Constitution, he didn't really want to be in those fights that much. And oddly enough, he, but he was to some degree. And oddly enough, when it came to the Revolution itself, he didn't necessarily want to be holding arms in that one. But he wrote the Declaration of Independence with the help of so many people, including uh, uh, John Adams but, and Ben Franklin, but he was, as you well know, the primary drafter of one of the greatest documents in human history, the Declaration of Independence, drafted not far from here. All right, Jefferson is a young man. He was 33 years old. He was a young writer. He knew he was a great writer. In fact, on his gravestone at, stone at Monticello, there are a number of ways he could have described himself, but the first word on that gravestone under his name is writer. So you can imagine how important it was to be a writer, to be writing one of the great documents, to be pouring his head and his brain and his passion and his heart into it, but then having to give drafts of it to these fabulous other geniuses, the members of the genius cluster that invented our nation. According to David McCullough, whose research in this area I think is the most solid, the most compelling, Jefferson rarely protested or cried or hit the table when big cuts were made in his declaration. But he actually protested a beautiful part of the declaration in which he addresses England. He is America, he addresses England. And after listing the degradations of King George III and the Parliament of England, Jefferson cried out in this passage, we had such wonderful history together. In the future, we could have been such friends together. And when you read it, it, it hits your heart like an arrow. Indeed, we could have been such friends together, but it is the moment when you know this cool, even chilly character. Mr. Jefferson wrote also with his heart, not only his head. It was cut from the document, probably in part for reasons of space, probably because, you know, the men editing the Declaration of Independence were not into declarations of affection and emotion towards England at the moment. You know, things always get cut, not for one reason, but for various reasons. But it's so interesting you should mention that, because I love that piece, because it's about a writer loving his work because he loves what he was saying. 
And, and also about the, the, the truth even of ideas that get edited, because of course we became such great friends. Yes, so, yes. Um, obviously you were particularly close to President Reagan. Um, you say about him in the book that he was, quote, the last unambiguously successful president. So I want to ask you a couple things about that. First, what in your view earns him that description? Uh, do you believe it was his extraordinary strengths as you see it, uh, or perhaps weaknesses uh, that you see in those that have followed him? Um, and secondly, uh, do you think we can have in our current politics another unambiguously great president? I believe there is, there has not always been Reagan nostalgia. There is great Reagan nostalgia in the United States now. I know it. I hear it all the time. I get it in my email when I appear. People say, when will we have another Reagan, which is a question that makes me slightly impatient. It sounds like somebody in 1901 saying, oh, when will we have another Lincoln? <laughs> Stop that. You're not going to have another Lincoln, but Teddy Roosevelt is down the block. Go help him. Do you know what I mean? There's greatness around you. All right. I believe what is behind Reagan nostalgia, which didn't begin the day he left office, but began in the middle of the 2000s. I know this because I'm on the road a lot talking to Americans. It began in the middle of the 2000s when people started to think, this thing isn't working. By this thing, Republicans meant the Bush administration, but Democrats meant that also. And they were thinking, when was the last unambiguously great two-term presidency? And they would all, Democrats and Republicans, go back to Reagan. The reasons, it's not because he was charming and funny and a lovely human being and decent. It has to do with things like, oh, the wall came down. Oh, the Soviet Union was defeated. Oh, the American economy was lifted from the doldrums and made something uh, that could work again. Oh, high tax, uh, the highest individual tax rate went from 70-something to 20-something. Oh, the American military was rebuilt. These are all serious and substantive uh, achievements that you can point at for that eight year period and add to that the fact <coughs> that Reagan had the character and nature of a leader. He did not embarrass you in front of the world. He did not humiliate you. He did not cause scandal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, he is the last unambiguously great president, not only do I believe, but I think the polls show the American people believe this. Uh, uh, can there be another one? I'm always in the school that says, of course, somebody can come along, govern well, shrewdly, wisely, strongly, honestly, in a reliable way. Let me say a last thing about Reagan. One of the things I saw on this book tour, and I wrote about it somewhere, I can't remember, maybe a column, is that people on my tour would always mention Reagan, and they would always mention his optimism, and say that was his power, his optimism. Wasn't he an optimistic guy? And the first time I let it go, and the second time I said, you know, I got it to an interview, I said, I got to disagree with you. Reagan's power was not optimism. Reagan, in fact, was confident. He was confident in himself. He was confident in you. And he was confident in the American systems and arrangements that allowed our government in its own rough way to work adequately in the world. <coughs> he had confidence. And he walked, when he walked into the room, we all looked at him, saw it, and that allowed us to feel optimistic. He was not optimistic. He was confident. He allowed us to feel optimistic. That's power, and that's someone with a genius for, I know how to do this. So by contrast, uh, you call President Obama the loneliest president since Nixon. Uh, can you explain the basis of that description? Do you know people keep asking about that column, and I keep forgetting what it was exactly that made me say that. But um, I'm telling you quite honestly, but, but uh, Obama always seems to me alone out there doing the Obama thing in a very singular and specific 
and alone way. He is highly unusual as a president in that he keeps around him the smallest and tightest little group of advisors, most of them from Chicago. They are real <coughs> political advisors. He tests everything against these people. This is not a guy who, like every previous president I have watched or known, reached out of his bubble and called this guy and that woman and went to see this one and got this one in. It's too tight. It's too lonely. It's too constricted in there. It's bad for him. It's hurt his presidency. Let's go back uh, to uh, what Bob mentioned and perhaps the thing you're most known for, the, the, the Challenger speech. Uh, you, the book includes a lecture that you gave at Harvard about writing uh, the speech. Um, you say that you relied on that critical day when time was so short. You relied on a hunch. Uh, can you tell our audience what that was and how it worked? Briefly, the, um, the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion was obviously unexpected, obviously shocking and rattled the Reagan White House. I mean, we were all watching it. We're all proud of our space program. We've been proud of our space program for 30 years. It was something wonderful that gave us always beautiful progress and a sense of pride and moving onward. Suddenly this thing explodes right in the air in front of everybody, live TV. I was in the White House, I had the TV on, Suddenly the TV goes silent. I could see something funny on the TV screen. I put up the volume and all you could hear was this static, this creepy static, because Mission Control and NASA didn't know what had happened, so they had nothing to say. And then they started to say these funny bureaucratic words that sounded like, oh my God, we don't know what happened, but we think we just saw it explode. In the White House, we were supposed to have the State of the Union speech that night, meaning everybody's attention was on that, but the work was all done. So frankly, in speech writing, we were having a nice, quiet day. I knew the president was going to have to speak as the story unfolded. I knew that, that it was just going to have to be done. I went to my boss and I said, I've started work on this. He said, thank you, God. Good. Go. He's on the phone with everybody, you know, fielding a million things. The president's on the phone with NASA, with foreign leaders, with tr handling the whole situation. Woman from the National Security Council ran into my office. She had just spent about 20 minutes with the president. She in his office and had a meeting with Anchorman. She wrote down everything he said. That became the spine of the speech. She ran into my office with her notes. I suppose they're out in the Reagan Library. I worked from that. I worked from imagination. As I was watching on CNN, the tape that they kept playing over and over and over again of these poor astronauts who we knew were very likely dead. As they, the last time we saw them, was when they were taken from their NASA uniform station out on the little bus to the takeoff pad. And in this film that they kept showing over and over, the astronauts were merrily waving goodbye in their, in their heavy gloves. As I watched that, I just remembered a poem I had learned as a kid. It's the poem High Flight by John Gillespie McGee Jr. It's about the joy of flying. And it ends with the words, um, my gosh, I'm, block, I'm blocking. Say it again. Slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. And I just thought, that, you know, that's just, that's the end of this speech. <clears throat> and I wrote it in a way <clears throat> that I thought it would work. But I had no chance to talk to Reagan, and I knew Reagan is not going to use that quote. He's, he's not going to say that unless he knows that poem. Okay, does Reagan know this poem? I don't know, but I have a hunch maybe he does. It's the end of the speech. Speech goes through a very truncated, shortened staffing process, meaning nobody had enough time to screw it up. The president had to speak very, very quickly. I mean, I sound like... This is Thomas Jefferson. The great part about England got in because no one had time to screw it up. 
But really, sometimes in life, when nobody has time to screw it up, it works. Speech comes on. Reagan looked so just. Reagan looked dashed. He looked sad. And he's talking to the country. One of the challenges of the speech had been that we had realized that children in America, grade school children, were watching the live takeoff of the Challenger. So all of our children in this country witnessed this disaster and didn't understand it. Middle school kids watched it. 80-year-old people watched it. So we had to talk to everybody in a way that patronized nobody. It's a little bit hard because we patronize children as we patronize the old. All right, so Reagan's going through this speech, gets to the end, says, speaks of the last time we saw them when they waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth. Reagan never thought, Reagan that night did not think the speech had done what needed doing. He, he left feeling dashed. I picked up, from what I was seeing of him, also a feeling of disappointment. And we didn't meet the moment, however you meet a moment like that. I went home sad, as everybody else did, but sad also for an extra reason. By the time I came in the next morning, things had changed a little bit. I could tell. I mean, it was just in the air. Overnight, I started to see a change. But when I went in that morning, I mean, there was a call from Tip O'Neill. I was a little schmagoogie in a corner of the old executive office building. I, I am a known person now, but I was not a known person then. I was not well known at all. Tip O'Neill had to look for me to call me. And the Democratic leader of the House of Representatives, and it's tough and hard a partisan as you can be, called me up to say you did great work for your country yesterday. Oh my God, it just pierced me. Reagan called. And he told me, he's a very honest guy, he said, you know, I didn't think that speech would work, but I've changed my mind. And I asked him why he had changed his mind. And there were a number of reasons, but the one that was most memorable to me was that he said, and you know, Frank Sinatra called me. <laughs> and Frank doesn't call after every speech. <laughs> one of those few moments when you worked for Reagan, everything was about foreign policy and domestic policy. You forgot, you never thought of him as someone who had had his early manhood in adulthood in Hollywood. But now and then he'd say something like that, like Sinatra called me. And believe me, if he says it's good, it's good. <laughs> and of course he was right about Sinatra, he had perfect taste. Uh, but anyway, that was, the reason that's in the book, it's the only reference to a speech for Reagan or, or Bush, I believe, in the entire book. And it's there because I was speaking to a Harvard University class in government, a fabulous class. Uh, that is always full of people who want to go into government. And I wanted to speak to them. I wanted to communicate this small thing. You're going to be in government. You're going to go in every day. It's going to get boring. It's going to be the same old, same old. You're going to slack off. You're going to think this isn't important. And then one day you're going to walk in and something big is going to happen. And you are going to have to meet that moment. And if you meet that moment, you will remember that for the rest of your life. It will make everything worth it. But no, when you go in every day, this could be the day. And that's okay. You need it. We had a great conversation, me and those young kids. I loved it. There's a... Uh, I'm going to try to make my questions shorter. I know I'm running on long, but I always like my stories. It's like, let me tell you another one. <laughs> There's a whole section of the book. Um, that are uh, in the in the matter of eulogies or, or, or obituaries. Yes. Yes. Um, so I want to ask you, what does a writer learn about life by writing about people who have passed away? That is a great question. Here's one of the things I discovered when I went through all this work. I mean, 30 years. This is from when I started out at CBS in the 70s. Um, I'm going through this work, and I'm, and themes are emerging. And that's good for me because I would like to do, you know, to have different chapters. One of the things I can see from the early 1980s straight through the last year is that when someone I really respect or whose work I respect 
or who I knew and think did something or some things with valor or grace or help things out, I stop and I love to write about their lives. One of the things I discovered in finding that I've been writing about people after they died for 30 years is that in every single piece at some point, sometimes in the lead, but sometimes in the middle, I concentrate on the meaning of their work. I really did find that one of my personal themes in life, in my life and in my head, is the importance and meaning of the work we do in the making of the meaning of a human life. <coughs> work is important. They used to say, the Catholic Church used to say, to work is to pray. I heard that when I was a kid, but I didn't realize I had absorbed it and come to see work as so full of the meaning and the, the nub of a person's life. I loved Joan Rivers, who was a friend of mine who I was lucky to be friends with, who I met through, uh, through a friend, and, and we became friends. But it was her work that was at her essence. And so I, I really did try to define, after she died, uh, the work that she did, and also the nature that she had. What a surprising person she was, in that she was exactly what you saw in public, and she was other things that she didn't let you see, like a great reader of books like a sort of a puller down of those who she thinks have gotten a little too fancy. Um, in the case of Tim Russert, the work. People miss journalists these days. It's so funny. Journalists are very nostalgic for Reagan, but they're also nostalgic for Tim, Tim Russert. And I'm happy to go with it because they say to me, you know, we have scandals now with with anchors and anchor men and anchor women being the moderators of debates and thinking that they are the stars of the show. Do you know what I mean? Showing so much ego, showing so much desire for attention, being show-offs, being ideological in a way that once would have been considered classless. So journalists bring up Tim and I say, you should all be wearing a little thing on your wrist that says, not what would Reagan do, but what would Russert do? Tim was a democratic operative. That's how he started out. He worked for Mario Cuomo. He worked for Pat Moynihan. He worked on the Hill as a democratic operative. Then he went into journalism. And when he went into journalism, he just decided, I'm going to be fair. I'm going to be fair to Republicans and ask them questions. I'm going to be fair to Democrats. He was an equal opportunity griller. He showed great respect for conservatives by bothering to understand what they thought and why they thought it. Not everybody in media even bothers to try to understand that. Um, so he's greatly missed. There's a bunch of other people, Tennessee Williams, who moved my heart very much. I'm going to stop talking now because I, I have to give you a chance to talk. You have all these questions and like, you've only gotten to number four. So I'm going to stop bloating. No, no, no. No, not, not at all. Um, as I said, we could go on all night, even though we can't. Um, one, of the, one of the great lives that you wrote about uh, after a passing uh, was Jackie Kennedy. Um, and there's a, a, a phrase in your piece about uh, Jackie's death that really struck me. You, you quoted a British comment to the effect that Jackie supplied to the United States the only thing Americans have ever lacked which is, quote, majesty. Yes. So my question isn't about Jackie. It's about America and, and majesty. Um, do you think that, there, that that can be, needs to be, a part of American public life? And do you think, in the age of Twitter and reality TV, <clears throat> that it's possible? <clears throat> um, well, let me say, the, the British journalist I quote said that the weekend after the burial of Jack Kennedy. So she was saying it in the 60s. I do think that the Reagans and the first Bushes did a lot to bring a sense of class and dignity uh, uh, to the White House, just as Jack and Jacqueline Kennedy had. Um, I know that I am, you know, Twitter doesn't disturb me. I like Twitter. I'm on Twitter. I like Facebook. All these things are okay. but. 
it, it very much disturbs me when America's representative to the United Nations is constantly tweeting to the world things like, Burundi needs a new leader, see to it. I mean, she says absurd things. It's undignified and it is lacking in a, in a certain distance that government should have stature. I'm going to put the word majesty aside because in a way it's too big and too loaded. But government should have, have stature. When you have real stature, you're not always in everybody's face 24-7 going, nah, 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 through every way you can do that. In my time, I have seen presidents go from not talking that much to the American people so that every time they made a big speech from the Oval Office, it was news. It was like, wow, the presidents can talk from the Oval <laughs> Office tonight. Now they, they're always talking, just always. They're always in your face. There's a media school that says the president's face has to be imposed on his time. He constantly has to be there in your face talking. You're never far from the sound of his voice. I think it's sick and it lowers the stature of the presidency. It probably affects the mental health of the presidents who do that because they probably start to think they're like, magical beings like Kim Il-sung. Yeah. But, but when you make something, let me just briefly say, when you make something common, you make it common. You know? You just do. Can I note something about the Challenger speech? That speech made a great impression on people. It was only five minutes long. Do you know why it was only five minutes long? Because Ronald Reagan didn't think it was about him. He didn't think it was about his emotions. He would never think, this is a disaster. Everybody will be looking at it. Use it to advance yourself and your agenda. It wasn't about that. It was about an American tragedy. He had boundaries. He had his space. He was your leader. He was speaking as a leader to the children and, adult, and adults of our country who witnessed something all together that was terrible. He was also speaking to the world. But he wasn't going on in this mawkish, horrible language they use now, you know, where they, you know, Mrs. Smith and I and all of the Smith children and our cousins feel so bad about all the Joneses and their laws. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like that horrible smarmy world of today, it was dignified. Thank you. <laughs> A couple of more uh, overtly political and, and policy questions before we end. Um, in, in one of your, your uh, past columns that I think has a, an obvious relevance to the present, um, a piece you wrote about Bill Clinton, um, you called him the American Caligula. <laughs> so um, I lost my temper. <laughs> I really did. But, but my question is, um, what do you think uh, it means for America uh, if we elect as president the wife of the American Caligula? <laughs> uh, look, here's why I lost my temper with Bill Clinton, and. It, and in a way, uh, I have some feelings about those days in which I wish a bunch of us had done things a little bit differently. Bill Clinton dragged America through this famous mess and made it horrible, but also allowed a world with a certain amount of piggishness in it to look at our great nation and say, look, they're pigs, too. It did nothing to help us in the world. It lowered us. It made us, you know, we went from the GIs who saved Europe on the Normandy beach to this seamy drama with these emotionally incontinent people who are running America. So it was just awful. And it made me lose my temper because I'd seen presidents with dignity and class operate. And to see that crew was terrible. However, looking back on those days, I wish 
We have never had the deposition for the president. I wish the deposition had never been made public. I wish our kids hadn't heard it. I wish all of the adults in America had agreed, you know what, we know, we know what went on here. Okay, we know. We make our own judgments, but we're not gonna talk about it endlessly for a year because it's gonna be a cultural catastrophe if we do. And I believe a cultural catastrophe did happen. Now, do I want Mr. Clinton's wife to be the next president? No. <laughs> I am the author of the case against Hillary Clinton. Which people are pressing me to, to, uh, to republish. But I feel like I said what I had to say. I'll give you an irony. This is a, a self-referential irony. A friend of mine recently sent me the New York Times scathing review of my book, The Case Against Hillary Clinton. They didn't like it in the year 2000. They didn't like it mostly because I said presumptuous things like, she's using New York as a base to run for president, you know. And I outlined everything that was coming down the pike. But they didn't know it was coming down the pike at the time, but I did. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's, 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 <laughs> let's move on. Um, five years before the Arab Spring, uh, you wrote a column in which you said that tyrants in foreign lands often function as, quote, garbage can lids on their society, end quote. Clearly, uh, in the years past, some of these lids have been removed. Some of these tyrants are gone. Some of them by the force of the United States. We removed uh, some of those lists. Exactly. And some by indigenous forces. Yes. Um, when I read the book in its entirety, I see strains of international moralism uh, and strains of international realism in various parts of, of your writing, um, as well as deep concern for what you call American self-renewal uh, at home. Yes. Um, putting all that together, uh, big question, but we are at the World Affairs Council. What do you see as the proper role for the United States in dealing with human disasters like we see in Syria, in countries where the garbage can lid has been, to one extent or another, removed, whether by us or by the local? <clears throat> That's an awful, awful, awful big question involving things like Syria, serious Syria policy, uh, at this point, plus an overview as to where we should be and what we should be doing. I'll tell you this. I am watching the presidential contest very closely on the Republican side where it's big and brawly and on the Democratic side where it's weird and constricted. Um, but at least we have arguments going on. I have not yet seen anybody come forward and offer an overall strategic sense of where America should be and what it should be trying to do for itself to increase its safety and prosperity in the world as it goes forward in the 21st century. Nobody has come up with that. Everybody's got little slivers of, they say things like, I interview them. I say things like, what's your vision of America for the future? And they say, well, and definitely in Syria, we need a no-fly zone. <laughs> Do you know, and that, they think, is an answer. Overall, one of the things we have to remember is that, I'm going to say something awful, but history is an abattoir. History is a bloody, horrible thing. It just is, it always has been. Interrupted by great moments of progress and peace within a context of, oh my God, what's the third law of human of thermodynamics? Sooner or later, everything turns to merit. I mean, you gotta, <laughs> you have to have a sense of tragedy about life. We cannot go forward as a nation thinking always we will fix it. When it comes to the middies, <laughs> a great thinker on foreign affairs, or at least an adequate one. A former Secretary of State who actually does think said to me, everybody in America facing a question on foreign policy unconsciously goes through the question, 
is this Munich, this particular issue, or is this Vietnam, this particular issue? Are we avoiding something and we'll pay a terrible price, or are we getting into something and we'll pay a terrible price? <coughs> I believe the American people essentially look at the Mideast and think, this is Chinatown. This is a place where no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, it isn't going to quite work out. I'm not sure if I should pivot to what I think Obama has done wrong here, which is essentially everything. Um, on, on the issue of Syria, I've actually never seen a president be quite as wrong for so long, so consistently, as he has been on, on Syria from, in my view, Assad must go, whoa, we're going to get rid of him, and then you do nothing. You say of the leader of another sovereign country, Assad must go, and then you do nothing. And you say, oh, Assad's fighting his own people, oh, he does anything with those bad, bad chemicals, we're going to go get him. Better not cross that red line. And he crosses the red line, and we do nothing. I mean, that's just awful, calling ISIS the JV team. So we've made quite a hash of it. I see John McCain and Lindsey Graham come on and say the answer is 40,000 boots on the ground. I'm not sure that's the answer. But I know I do want someone in the future who's a leader knowing two things. One is history is tragic. The other is don't do something you're not going to see through to the end, and you better know your people and know what they'll see through to the end. Do I hate ISIS, and do I wish we had taken a punitive hit at them? I certainly do. After Paris, yes. I also think, let me just finish up. I know I'm bouncing, or I'm, I'm going too long. But I recommend to you the thinking of Mike Morrell, a former We've, we had him a few months ago. Oh my God, well, I don't think he was saying this a few months ago, though, so he wouldn't have said it to you. He was asked about, about policy towards ISIS right now. He was pressed by a TV interviewer, what should we do? And he said, here's an idea for you. We all fear they are coming, and they're going to do a hit on us again, as they did in the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. He said, concentrate on this. Make believe they just hit us and it's the day after, what are we going to do? He said the answer to that question, what are we going to do, is possibly the answer to the question, what should we be doing now? Yeah. Now, that's a guy who was thinking. And I, and I, so I've been going around quoting him, and everybody disagrees with me. But i got to tell you, there's some wisdom in that, I can tell. Uh, Our people are not going to be happy if they get hit again. Much as I regret it, I'm going to ask only one more question, and then we're going to take some questions. This one. Oh, good, good. Um, you wrote uh, in, uh, in an essay uh, that the very best thing said in 2011 was, oh, wow, oh, wow, um, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Can you tell our audience who said it? And Great who words. Yeah, I was writing a, uh, an end-of-the-year article in the year 2011. And sometimes I write things about what was the best thing said this year. And the thing that struck me most that had been said in 2011 was no contest. It was the last words reported by his family of Steve Jobs as he died. He was in a hospital bed in California. He had gotten for so long all of the best and most creative, I guess, treatment. He was not savable. He was dying. He knew it. His family knew it. They had surrounded him at his bed, his sister, his wife, uh, his children. And he was looking at them very lovingly at the end. And then suddenly he looked away, sort of at a corner of the room where there was nothing. And he said with an air of wonder, oh, wow. Oh, wow. And then he died. His sister, the novelist Mona Simpson, a very brilliant woman, wrote about this uh, in a eulogy for Steve Jobs and also in a piece for the New York Times. I wrote to her soon after and said, could you please tell me more? I so admire this story. It's so moving to me. And she said, I can't say more than I've said. But she's very nice about it. Here's what was so beautiful. We all have smart friends. You call up, you say, 10 of your smart friends. And you tell them the story of Steve Jobs' last words, and you say, what do you think that was about? 
normally people will pop off with their opinions, but I was so touched that the 10 or 12 people I called their email just kind of listened for a moment. And sometimes they'd go, wow. And nobody said those things people say after to describe such a moment. The scientist I called, I thought he'd say, ah, uh, he probably had a vision that was produced by the exploding, uh, uh, the chaotic exploding of neurons having their final messages to each other. Called up a Christian person, he did not say he saw Jesus. He didn't say he, the other one who's superstitious didn't say he saw his mom. She was welcome, welcoming him to the other side. They all just treated the story with such respect and said, wow. And I, I loved that. But we all know whatever Steve Jobs saw, he saw something real big. Thank you. Questions from the audience, please? <clears throat> Thank you for asking about that. That's such a touching story. And I want to say right off, that obviously we're not going to get to everybody, but we're going to do better. And I'm going to say, I love single part questions, not multi-part <laughs> questions. Because I can't remember all the parts of multi-part questions. I have a single part question. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Um, one of the many things I always love about reading your work is your observations on national character. And I'm a nurse, so I think a lot about health insurance and what works, what doesn't, what might work. Yeah. And many countries with whom we have a lot in common in other ways um, seem very uh, favorably to think of their national health plans, you know, sure. UK and Scandinavia. Oh, in England, it's like right. part of the national character at this point. Right. And yet, you know, in this country, and it's hard to tell how much of it is just the sort of incompetence of the health system, you know, the Obamacare. But in terms of national character, what are your observations about why it isn't more uh, the idea of a better, you know, something better isn't more appealing in this country? Let me answer it by saying what I thought Obama would do and what he should have done when he was an early on young president and he decided he was going to push health care or, or health insurance or health as an issue. There were a number of ways he could have gone as a young president, a number of issues he could have, could have uh, put the emphasis on. One was to realize, I mean, the Obama White House later kind of admitted they didn't understand the depth and breadth of the economic collapse that we were in, in 09 and 10. That's sort of why they went to help. They didn't understand the economy was the most demanding thing. All right, so he goes to healthcare and he creates this like Rube Goldberg on LSD <laughs> system that doesn't work. I was surprised. Here's what I thought he'd do if he pivoted to healthcare. I thought he'd be clever, just a real clever SOB, and do the most brilliant thing. That's huddle with the defeated and demoralized Republicans. And tell them, you know what we're going to do? We are going to clean up Medicare a little bit. There's a lot of waste, fraud, and abuse in it. And uh, we're going to uh, clean up Medicaid a little bit. There's a little waste, fraud, and abuse. The Republicans are going to be so happy. Oh my god, we're going to save some money. The Democrats will be confused, but you have to let them know that something's coming. So you do some things that clean it up, make it a little tighter, sharper, better, more responsive to the moment, to the hospital you're working in, better systems. And then about 11 o'clock in the morning on Tuesday, you say, by the way, anybody who needs health care in America who doesn't have it, we're going to let them in on, on Medicare. Just let them in. Give them a card. The Democrats will be thrilled. They'll say, yay, we got coverage. The Republicans, having bragged that they saved so much and that everything's in such better shape, will be limited from going crazy in their opposition. That's where I thought health care was going to go. If you need it, we'll get it for you. You know, and not this Rube Goldberg uh, contraption. 
uh, you know, which is just, it only messed up a messed up system. You know this, more messed up a messed up system. Look, I'm kind of easy going on these things. I'm kind of, I don't want anybody who is in America not to be able to get hospital treatment and medical treatment that they need. We're a very wealthy nation. We can work this out in a way that is reasonable. I will add, a friend of mine who is itinerantly employed and has no health care, about two years ago had to have his, uh, he got very sick, he's so sick he can't get out of bed. He lived on the west side of Manhattan in a bad neighborhood, called up a doctor he met once, said I'm really sick, doctor said come see me. This guy goes to see the doctor, doctor starts poking him, says, you know, I gotta tell you, you, I think, have an appendix that is either bursting or about to burst, and you need to have this yanked down. The guy says, I don't have any insurance. I can't even pay you. I can't have my appendix taken out. Doctor picks up the phone, calls a local hospital, gets the guy on the ER, says, this guy's gonna die. Fit him in, take him in, take him upstairs and yank out his appendix. The hospital ER guy says, sure, send him in. Mm -hmm. They took care of this guy. They put him up on the fourth floor. They gave him the, the operation. He didn't get charged. He looked <coughs> at the nurse. This was only two years ago. He looked at the nurse and he said, who's paying for this? And she made a motion with her hands like, we have ways of taking care of this. It's coming out of here. It's coming out of here. It's coming out of here. <laughs> Private hospital, by the way. Um, You know where I stand? Do it. Have a health care system for everybody, but make it work. Don't make it the disaster that we have. And don't base it on the UK disaster either. Go on over on this side. Thank you. Uh, we loved your poem about uh, writing with the music scores. Yeah. And I want you to know that uh, Leonard Bernstein's On the Waterfront is my favorite as well. On the waterfront. Oh my God, that makes me cry. And really sometimes I can't, if I'm doing a light column, I can't do on the yeah. waterfront because I'll go, oh, <laughs> start to cry. I know you lost out to the high and the mighty, Dimitri Tiamat. I don't, look, yes, that's a very good choice, but it doesn't float my boat. My question is with all the uh, Republican candidates, do you believe it's possible that somebody not in the picture now is going to be the Republican candidate in 2000? Do I think it's possible that somebody who is not on the stage right now for a republic for the Republican debates could actually get in and change everything? Yes. Are we talking Mitt Romney? <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who we we'd be talking about. Do you know? know? Okay. Right. This has been such a freakish year that anything could happen, and I'm open to anything. If you had told me a year ago that more than 50% of the Republican base will want one of three choices, a businessman with an unusual temperament and personality, a brain surgeon with no political experience, and a CEO um, who ran for office once in California and got drunk. That's half or more than half of Republican likely voters say those three are, are together, they would rather have that choice than a standard governor or a senator or somebody with political experience. This is a wild year. I didn't know Donald Trump was going to take off the way he did until I watched his live, I watched his announcement speech, and I knew he hit a throbbing nerve when he talked about illegal immigration. The biggest, the biggest destroyer of bonds in the Republican Party in my time has not been Iraq and Afghanistan. I believe it has been. It started in about 2005. The distance between how the base feels about illegal immigration and how every party sophisticate feels about it illegal immigration, and there's, there's no space between them. It's a really horrible break 
if it turns out the Republican Party is in the midst of breaking up right now, as we may find if Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump does well, really wins in New Hampshire, wins in South Carolina, and then starts to win in Florida, that'll be the base of the party saying to the establishment, I hate you. And that'll be the establishment, I think, saying to the base, you are not picking my nominee. That'll be a party breaking up, breaking in two. So we may see that this year. Could an outsider, you know, get in? Why not? Everybody else is in the pool. <laughs> I mean, what the hell? We're going to have to, the last question is going to come from this side. First, thank you for coming here. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate it if you could help me out on this. Uh, this issue. Uh, one of the major, uh, I don't know, programs, uh, beliefs of the Democratic Party is to make it extra difficult for Asian Americans to get their kids into America's best universities so as to free up space for other uh, minorities. I would think that if that being the case, uh, Asian Americans would detest the Democratic Party. Instead, I think they vote 75% Democrat, something like that. And I'm wondering if you know what must the Republican Party be doing that so repels them that they would act that way. Thank you. Well, nobody likes Republicans. <laughs> you know I mean? Republicans half the time don't like Republicans. I'll never forget a conversation with my son. He's now a grown man, but he, when he was a teenager, when he was about 14 or 15, growing up in a very liberal environment in New York City, he was talking to a wonderful friend of mine and of his father's, a very conservative woman, very, very strict, definite views. My son listened to her talk at the dinner table one night, and then he turned to her and he said, why don't Republicans act nice? And she said, she's a Southern girl, she said, because we're not. <laughs> and it cracked me up. <laughs> you are at a fabulous just you are at a fabulous advantage in life if you can go through as the Democratic Party does saying, I will give you anything, I'm not talking about the cost. I will support anything and not talking about the price. You're so open to everything. You're just like this nice democratic person. And then there's the Republican person saying, oh my God, you'll bankrupt us. Oh my God, that's too abnormal to do. Oh my God. So nobody likes us. So bright young immigrants, I think, pick up the vibration of nobody likes us. That's part of it. By us, I mean conservatives. That's part of it. Um, uh, another is that the Republican Party does nothing to defend itself. You know? They've spent almost a generation saying, we're not as bad as Democrats. Well, why would anybody follow you for not being as bad as Democrats? That's not a good enough reason. So, I kind of get it, what's going on with the young, but as those immigrants grow older, I cannot believe that they will stay in the party they believe they've joined. But at least the Democrats welcome them. I'll end with this image. My mother, up until a few years ago, lived in uh, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And Bay Ridge is fabulous in part because it is full of every ethnic group, every country is represented there. At the annual fall fair, which we went to every year, I loved it so much. Asians, Russians, people from Uzbeka, Beka, Bekistan, as Herman Cain <laughs> used to say, Africans, people in in native dress, everybody was some from someplace else. The Irish are still coming over. It was so beautiful, everybody was there. Now, by tradition at this annual autumn fair, local politicians set up booths and set up tables and welcome you. All the Democrats had welcoming tables. There was not a Republican welcoming table. I actually went myself to a Democratic table, it was an Obama table in, in 2012, and stood there, said hello to everybody. We took pictures together. It was very affectionate and adorable. And then when people come by, I'd say, you might consider being a Republican. <laughs> everybody would go, shh, shh, be quiet, lady. But you know, I'd reach out to people, and they'd kind of listen, like, oh, you could be a Republican. Oh my god, who knew? 
<laughs> so that's all. Peggy, thank you.